My name is Hans Jesperson. I'm a systems engineer with uh, Solid Systems. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about big data in motion, basically. So the, the movement, very large movement, uh, high, high speed, high fan out, high performance um, data on the move. Uh, and I'm going to try and, and relate that as much to real world scenarios that I've, uh, I've been involved in. Uh, I've been in the middleware space for about 25 years, over 25 years now, so um, with several different uh, um, companies. Um, so I've worked, on, I've worked on systems at eBay and, and Yahoo and some pretty large scale systems. And a couple of the more recent ones are in here that are kind of interesting. But uh, first I want to put it, this in context. Big data, everybody talks about big data as kind of a, the buzzword du jour, I guess, or, or maybe even past that now. Um, and this is, um, this is a, a market analysis done by a pretty well-known uh, Forbes contributor where it's broken out big data into all these different categories, right? Everybody's got a different spin on it, whether they're business intelligence or the actual lower level technologies we've been talking about for several years now, Hadoop and so on. All the analytics, various different ways of doing analytics, whether it's, it could be log data, it could be all kinds of data, right? There's now much more vertical big data applications, right? Whereas different types of data are being analyzed in different ways for different types of users. But the thing that is kind of conspicuously not on this chart is, is anything to do with really the movement of data. This is all data at rest, right? This is, you get it into your big data repository, you store it in a certain way, and then what are you going to do with it? How are you going to analyze it? So I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk about something different. I want to talk about how does the data get in to these repositories. I want to talk about how that becomes more real time. Um, and how some of the analytics that you could do on it would be more real time, and then how you're going to react to uh, the information that you're going to get out of this, this streaming information, right? So the point, of, the point of the talk is data movement. And, uh, you know, we've been moving data around on networks for several decades now. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, it, it started off with the big mother of all databases in the middle and you put everything in the mainframe and you queried the mainframe, right? And, and, and then we've, we've had our generations of slowly making that more and more distributed um, and, and introducing new technologies into the mix and making it more real time as well. So it used to be uh, ETL, data marts, and, OD, and operational data stores, right? You were kind of moving stuff around and, and if you were moving it in 15 minute increments, then it seemed really fast, right? But uh, that, that doesn't really work anymore when you're trying to do real-time upsell, cross-sell for a retail app or when you're trying to do fraud detection real-time or you're trying to do homeland security or you're trying to do some of these kind of, you know, you have Google cars driving around now. <laughs> you can't wait 15 minutes to analyze some data. You've got to be doing it in real time, right? So massive amounts of data coming in being driven by a couple of factors that I'm going to talk to. Um, but, you know, <laughs> does anybody remember these? <laughs> yeah? Okay, good. There's no old timers around. I think it was a 110 baud modem, acoustic coupler, right? So you think it just, it's, we've come a long way. I mean, it was amazing going through this and getting on bulletin boards on my Commodore 64 and all that kind of stuff, right? And, you know, now we have to think really hard on how we're going to fill the pipes that we have, right? We have 100 gigabit Ethernet now. Uh, you know, even with 10 gig, people were like, how are we going to fill these pipes? Um, so, you know, but, you know, whenever we have more bandwidth, we always find ways to fill it. And I think modern data movement is a, a very complex set of internetworking. It's, it's being driven by sensors. Uh, it's being driven by video. It's being driven by sort of full mesh networking peer-to-peer. -peer. You know, it's not all just all flowing back into that big central location anymore. Um, data is being moved around uh, very rapidly. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, we have a demo on our booth where I'm showing, a, you know, a Pebble smartwatch controlling uh, the, the you know, locking and unlocking a Tesla, you know. So it, it, all real-time information flying around. And I think that's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's going to get multimedia again, you know, the same way that we went through the web where it used to be text and then it was images and then it was video. Now all of our little devices and, and things like that are going to be streaming real uh, video bidirectionally. So that, it, it, that's, that's the world we live in. So how are we going to adapt this kind of, uh, this ecosystem that's grown up around sort of the 
the big data warehouse in the middle, right? The big uh, data at rest and take it into this new world where everything is all real time and streaming, okay? So, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna break that down to three sections and then in each section I'm gonna go in and sort of talk about some of the main um, issues and, and some of the solutions to think about. So first is gonna be capture and collection of data, absorbing data as it's coming into these, uh, into these uh, repositories, particularly across wide area networks and wireless networks, which add you know, new complications. Then we're gonna talk about out the, out the back, how do we send alert, how do we send streams back out of these repositories um, I, 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 for, for various different uses. It could be a simple alert, or it could be you know, a customized uh, garden hose of information that's filtered just for you out of the fire hose that was coming in the other end, okay? And then what kind of new uh, technologies or existing technologies need to be integrated into the middle of this stack here to, to make all of this work, all right? So that's the framework. We're gonna revisit this slide and just drill down in each one of these areas and, uh, and, and, and uh, look at what's interesting. Uh, somebody put this uh, picture up here, actually, because it was good for like uh, capture and collect, right? A bee going out and getting pollen and bringing it back. And I thought this was a Photoshop job where somebody had just put a sensor on a bee, but I did some more research on it, and this is a real thing. There's actually, in the Uni uh, University of Oregon, they're doing research on putting sensors on bees you know, there's a big problem right now where a lot of bees are dying and nobody knows why. And they're such an important part of the ecosystem that they wanted to track them and, and, and put telemetry. So it's a multi-year project. I, I honestly don't know where they are right now. But that just blows my mind that, you know, these sensors are getting so powerful and so lightweight and, and so cheap, you know, that you can just scatter them everywhere. This whole, the, the, this dream of sort of the smart dust that you're just going to be able to throw around and control is probably not that far off, right? We're getting, we're getting concrete things there now. So if you can put a chip on a bee and you can track it, you certainly can put a chip on every piece of mail, every package, every vehicle, every important piece of business that's moving around, right? And, and react to that in real time. You know, it, it's kind of interesting. We did a proof of concept in Japan where they were doing the equivalent of a FedEx delivery where you could tell you know, in real time, get the package routed to wherever you were. You know, they had to know where the recipient was in real time. They had to know where the package was in real time. So rather than wasting time going to somebody's door and finding out they weren't home and then not leaving it there, you could just reroute all the trucks dynamically to the right place. So it, it's, a, it's a kind of very interesting world uh, when we bring all that kind of stuff into the mix. Um, so in capture and collecting data, there's three main uh, um, fundamental problems here. One is how do you manage millions of data sources, right? We're not talking about hundreds of clients or even thousands of clients. We're talking about millions of clients, particularly on the web, right? A lot of these sensors are now going to be embedded inside of your web page. So the banner, the navigation banner at the top of your web page is going to have a real-time web socket component in it. It's going to be collecting real-time data about how you're navigating on that site. It's going to tell not just the click stream, but whether you moused over something or not, right? All of that information is available because it's a rich client now. And the same is true on your phone. Even more is on your phone because you've got a sensor on there. You can actually see, you know, through the camera and all kinds of other things what's going on if people will let you. Um, so the, the amount of sensor information is going to be, it, it is exploding right now. The whole M to M space, you know, is, is, is growing as well, and that's going to add uh, that many more devices into it. So how do we manage millions of devices, and how do we manage them when they're producing at extremely, you know, bursty rates of information, right? Sometimes you get a sudden burst of information, and it comes down, and how do you size systems when, you know, you don't know, you don't have this nice steady stream of things coming in. So we'll talk about that, and then optimizing it to work over wide area networks, all right? So let's just talk about millions of sources. The classic way, at least in big data, for handling lots of ingestion of data is to partition and shard, right? You take every one of those streams, you figure out some algorithm to hash on it to make it go to one of your 100 servers. And every, you know, 1% of your load goes to, hopefully, to every one of your servers and it flows all the way through and it gets into the right node in your cluster and you're good, right? Um, and that works provided that 
all you're doing is taking one set of stream of data and you really can partition it on something and it's really just going to one place. But the more that you have multiple sources coming in, going to multiple different repositories in the back end, the more that this becomes a, a, a harder thing to do. So um, uh, just the classic vertical scalability of how do you get faster and faster individual nodes to deal with single streams that are, that are uh, higher and higher uh, 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 volume and throughput is important as well. And of course, you can still stack them up. So there's a lot of research going in this area. Um, I'm not, I, I really don't want to do a commercial for our company, so I'm not going to get into it. We happen, to, we happen to make some products in this area, but if you're interested in those, you can come see us in the vendor booth, right? But uh, the thing I wanted to talk about is this myth of horizontal scalability. And really, the, the killer here is, is the leakage that you get when you have any type of cross-traffic. In, in, that's coming in. So let's just say hypothetically you had a single message server or log aggregator or whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter, and it's, it has a hypothetical capacity of a thousand events a second or a thousand messages a second coming in. If you just had a thousand coming in and it was going to one place, you'd have a thousand coming in and put a thousand in there in that one node and you would be good. And then when you scale up to a second node, you'd think, okay, a second node, now I have 2,000 worth of scalability. Well, you do if the 1,000 goes in and goes to this node, and the other 1,000 goes in and goes to that node, and there's no cross-traffic whatsoever. The minute that there's any kind of data that's coming into this node that needs to go over there through this one, even if it's just, just say, 10%, okay? Now, all of a sudden, 10% of your load is being spent between these two nodes, right, just for the cross-traffic, which means you can only service 900 out to the endpoints. And as you grow second, third, fourth node, even if it's not a full mesh, and even if there's not a lot of traffic, this starts, the leakage starts to become a dominating factor that stops you from being able to just elastically scale this whole thing all the way up. Pretty soon, all of your traffic ends up being the cross traffic, and your actual capacity out of each broker is reduced. So that's the difference between you know, the world where it's not just one big database in the middle and it's all streaming in there, but I think the real world where you have click streams and activity data that needs to go into Hadoop, uh, but it also needs to go into solar for search. It also needs to go in your fraud detection system. Some piece of that also has to go, it'd be billable events and might have to go into the ad server or into um, you know, some marketing database or whatever, right? So I think this is kind of more the real world. Uh, uh, and, and we have to get back to, you know, not only building many, many more nodes, but building them more efficiently individually, okay? Um, the second, second piece I want to talk about was sort of this idea of the, the buffering, right? That's the big spikes of data that all of a sudden during the Super Bowl, you know, there's a whole lot of traffic goes on. Even carriers have to worry about this. They don't have capacity uh, uh, to, to handle all this incoming load, right? So I think of this as, the, I call it the python eating the pig problem, right? Where you got, you got the big, you big snake and he's trying to eat this big pig. <laughs> you can see the, you see the bubble going through him as he's, as he's eating, right? And it causes all kinds of disruption. Even just like a single very large message that your messaging server or a big event, you know, a big video uh, file or something that's going through, if you treat it as one blob, no different than all your smaller blobs, your latency just goes through the roof, right? Because now all of a sudden, your system has to handle this one big thing. Until you digest that pig, you can't eat another bite of anything else, right? So you have to start breaking these things up into smaller chunks and, and worrying about, you know, how do I interleave the smaller messages in between the big larger ones so they're not, they're not always at the back of the line, right? So these are the kind of tricks that, that, you, that you need to use. And if you really do need to have some sort of a shock absorber in the middle, right? You can't tightly couple your input devices into your storage in the back end because that means that you have to size your incoming system, and you have to size your back end system for the peak rate of your incoming data or you have to be willing to lose data when you exceed your capacity, right? So the whole idea of having decoupling, having uh, a, a, a message queue or some kind of intermediary that can be running while the back end system is life cycle, while you reboot it, while you upgrade it, or when you hit these peaks is an important component, I think, on, on handling large incoming streams of data. Okay? Um, let's see. Yeah, I covered most of the, the pieces there. 
So then the third piece, the third you know, uh, uh, complicating factor is it's coming, over the, the, the web. it's coming over the web, it's coming over wide area networks, it's coming trans-Pacific links with huge latency, right? And some of this data is pretty critical. You don't ever want to lose it, right? So it could be patient heart monitoring data. They're talking about doing sort of, uh, you know, home, home medical devices and things like that. So in that case, you, you always have this problem with the round trip time, right? If I'm producing information, it has to go all the way to where I'm going to persist it, and, it has to, and some sort of acknowledgement has to come all the way back before you know for sure that you haven't lost that message. You don't need to retransmit it, okay? And that round trip time, when you're going even east coast to west coast of the US, you're probably looking <coughs> at about 60 milliseconds, 75 milliseconds. You go trans-Pacific, it could be 125 or more. You start introducing um, you know, Wi-Fi and, and, and 4G and all that kind of stuff into the mix. You, know, you can get easily get up to 200 millisecond kind of latency. You have 200 millisecond latency, you can only do five round trips per second. That means this one stream of data is only capable of absorbing five events a second and, and not lose it, right? And <clears throat> so you, you, have to, you have to come up with ways to deal with that, right? And, and you, th there's multiple ways to do that. Uh, you get around the TCP sort of long fat pipe problems by having multiple streams, multiple sockets per client and being able to interleave across those. And you also have to increase your buffer size and your window size. You have to do this asynchronously where you're sending multiple messages in flight, you're waiting, you're holding on to those, you're getting multiple acknowledgements back and only when you get those acknowledgements can you delete those messages or consider them delivered, right? So, Big window sizes, big assured delivery or guaranteed messaging window sizes, multiple connections, that's the key for getting maximum throughput. And I've seen this time and time again where somebody, you know, they have a one gigabit link across the WAN and they can't understand why they're only getting 100 megabytes worth of throughput in it. And it's, you know, they have a single TCP socket and they just can't make that sliding window go fast enough. So those are, those are some of the tricks to look at. So, Going back out to the initial picture again, those are kind of three main areas to think about in terms of capturing the data on its way in. Now let's talk a little bit about the data on its way back out again, you know, so alerting and streaming, which really are kind of two very different things. You know, one, one is a single event, just says attack, could be very important, right, attack, or evacuate, or buy, or sell, right, very small message. But latency can be very critical, you know, and in financial services, it, 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 people care about co-locating. How many people here are in financial services? It's usually not so much maybe New York City. Okay, good. So we got, we got, so I mean, you do high frequency trading and things like that. You want to co-locate all your equipment in the, in the, as close as possible to the stock exchange. You want to do everything in FPGAs. You don't even have to worry about a kernel interrupt in your operating system, right? Messaging there is shared memory between two cores on the same machine because you don't want to take the extra 250 microseconds or nanoseconds of going you know, out, out to the network or something like that, right? Um, this is all about actionable events. So there's this life cycle that says, I've collected all this big data, I've done all my analytics, and I know that whenever there's a hurricane, people buy Pop-Tarts and beer, right? That's the classic one. So hurricane is coming, you know, get the Pop-Tarts and the beer at the head end of the store, right? That's your actionable event. Uh, and your actionable event is different in every, every industry and every use case. But, you know, if all we ever do is collect all this data and mine this data and discover something and then send out a memo and hope that somebody's going to deal with it, it it's not, it's not going to be as useful if, as if we can automate that. We can automate these things and we can create a feedback loop that says collect more and more information and see if this is still happening. Is it still true? you know, and, and, and dynamically change uh, uh, what, those, what those alerts are that are going out, okay? So we're, I'm also going to kind of break down the outbound into three main categories. Uh, one is massive fan out, right? How do you send either the same data to many, many people, kind of multicast, or how do I send similar data to different people in their own personalized streams so they all get exactly only what they want to get, right? That's, that's uh, that's the, the challenge there. And then how do you deal with the fact that inevitably they cannot consume it as fast as you're able to send it? And, and this is also very use case dependent. I'll get into the couple of different mechanisms that you use 
to handle you know, that, the chronic slow consumer. The slow consumer problem is like one of the biggest problems you know, in, in all kind of data movement uh, um, uh, architecture. Um, and then um, I'll talk also about sort of conflating data streams and, um, and, 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 how, and how you can use that uh, as a way to deal with chronic slow consumers. Okay, so I think the same way that all these sensors are leading to massive numbers of endpoints on the incoming side, they're also becoming recipients on the outbound side. And the outbound side is a lot more difficult, right? On inbound, you can use something like REST. If I want to send data, up, upload data to some server somewhere, I, you know, as a client, I'm in control, right? I'm just going to do an HTTP post or GET whenever I have data to send. But if I want to receive a stream from that, that center, you know, it, it can't call me, right? I have to be sitting there polling and polling and polling and polling. Is there something? No. Is there something? No. Is there something? No. So I'm eating up resources doing nothing. I'm eating up resources finding out that nothing is happening. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually a really interesting use case. I talked to the guys at Facebook and they were talking about the presence system. And th that's one of the, the, the poster child examples of where doing nothing really bogs down the system because if you're online and you're idle for a minute, it tells all of your friends, he, you know, Hans has been idle for one minute. And then if I'm idle for, an, for two minutes, it's got to go and tell everybody I've been idle for two minutes. So the more you're sitting around doing nothing, the more, you know, this network is compounding the number of messages that need to be sent out. So it's kind of, it's counterintuitive that you get these kind of effects. Um, so I think, the same is going to be true when it's not necessarily human on the far end, but it's probably more so true when it's a device on the far end that wants to be receiving lots of this uh, information. So how do we build a, a, a streaming, massive streaming uh, system? And you know, on the inbound, there's no, the connection doesn't need to stay open. You HTTP post, you're done, you tear down the connection. On the outbound, you, know, you keep that socket open, right? So it's a different kind of infrastructure that you need to have to deal with 10 million concurrent socket you know, connections that are out there. Um, but you know, use cases would be things like uh, the, you know, balancing the grid, uh, the electrical grid, or handling flow meters and pipelines and things like that, right? It's, it's the sky's the limit on that stuff. Um, so let's talk about slow consumers. I don't think anybody here is old enough to know that one firsthand, but I definitely enjoyed watching the reruns of I Love Lucy. Um, so how are you going to deal with the person that can't keep up on, on, on the production line, right? Um, and, you know, with, uh, with multicast, actually, with IP multicast, that's a big problem, right? Because when you send data out and somebody can't get it and you need to retransmit it, now you're retransmitting it to everybody, right? So the, uh, there's a lot of different research that's gone on from the vendors to figure out ways to do retransmissions. Um, or to send multiple copies of data so you don't have to uh, uh, do retransmissions and that kind of thing. You avoid this problem of having a knack storm where everybody is sending negative acknowledgments and then you're constantly rebroadcasting all the information out to everybody. Um, but, you know, um, the, the, the other one, let's see, am I missing a slide here? I'm going to talk about a couple of other uh, ways to, to deal with that. Well, let me talk about it now. So, um, if possible, you know, it's always, it, you're always going to have, you're going to have two situations. You're going to have one situation where a spike of outbound information exceeds the capacity that somebody can receive it for a period of time. But then it will go back down again and they'll be able to catch up, right? So, if the data is important that you have every single element, right? If you want to do a time series and you want to know every single sample and you don't want to lose any samples, you have to buffer that. And then you have to allow the slow consumer to be able to catch up and get all the data. But if it's item potent data where every single message is the current state, you know, it's my inventory. I have 10. No, I have 7. No, I have 5. No, I have 4. You don't care about the old stuff. Same thing is true in finance for ticker. You don't care about what the old bid is. You only care what the current bid is, right? then you can throw out those old messages as in the buffer. You can make a, an intelligent buffer that says, um, if this one consumer is 10 messages behind, I'll just throw nine of them out and only give them the latest message. 
So dynamically, each person can get whatever stream of information is the most that they can keep up with. And the minute they catch behind, uh, fall behind, they'll still always be guaranteed to get the most up-to-date records. Okay? So uh, there is no good name for that. Uh, we've called it uh, eliding. Some people call it conflation. Um, and, and there's a couple of different forms of this, too. There's another one where you know, if those records couldn't be just thrown away because they were updates, right? They were, let's say it's not just a full record, one, two, three, four, five, but each one of those modified a different field in a record, and you really do need all of those. What you can do then is collapse them together into one update that updates all five of those individual records, right? So that's, that's what we've termed conflation versus eliding, which is just throwing out the, the messages altogether. But both of those are two different tricks to be able to dynamically scale in the, in the face of uh, uh, slow consumers. Right? So that's, the, that's some, of the, some of the tricks on the outbound side. Uh, now let's take a look sort of in the, in the center, and then we'll get to some real-world uh, use cases to, to sort of tie it, uh, tie it all together here. So. Um, Real-time analytics and real-time routing and distribution, content-based routing, that kind of thing is, is what uh, I'm, I'm talking about now in the, in the center here. Um, and so the data is going to the data is going to flow in. It's still going to flow into your your repositories, right? But at the same time, it's got to selectively go out to a bunch of other types of engines that you might be running that are more real-time enabled, in-memory data grids complex event processing engines, custom homegrown algos of, of all kinds, you know, whether it's trading algos or fraud detection algos or something like that. All right? So um, how do we intelligently identify which pieces of this stream that's going into Hadoop you know, or, uh, or through Flume or whatever it is that needs to flow off to these other sites? Right? Um, and to what level do you put that metadata in a topic name or a queue name or something like that? Or, or are you really going to go and open up every single one of those messages and scan through looking for keywords in order to determine whether or not you want to do full-on content-based based routing to one of these engines, right? So that, that, that's, that's what that world looks like. And you know, increasingly, uh, and you'll see this in the use cases, People are using this to drive distributed data grids and, and, um, and distributed repositories, right? So instead of all flowing into one site, you might have uh, multiple data centers. You want to have a certain user's data flow to their home data center, um, and, and the, which would be the closest point of access for them. But like in the case of a mobile carrier, you know, the closest access when they're at home it, it, most of the time is in one data center, but when they're traveling, it might be a different data center. So do you want to dynamically start moving this data and replicating it out to the closest edge to wherever that user is? Um, you know, so if I walk into a local store when I'm on the East Coast and want to ask a question about my, my phone service or something like that, they actually have the data there ahead of time because they know the minute I turn the phone on when I, right, that it's there. So people, phone companies are doing this now. All right, so let's get into a couple of these use cases and, uh, and we'll take some questions. Uh, this is one actually I was involved in. Unfortunately, a lot of these, you can't mention the name of the customer, right? Because it's kind of pretty critical to their business so they don't, non-disclosures don't let us do it. But this is one of the largest railroad companies in the United States. And they have uh, trackside sensors. So they know the state of every switch on the rails. When, the, when a train, every train locomotive actually has like a little Linux box and a, 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 a computer on board on the train, um, a lot of times they're hauling hazardous material and things like that. They have sensors to monitor those. Um, and and they, they definitely know the position of where they are, but you know, as they're going around the country, it's not like they're in 3G range all the time. So they're on 220 megahertz radio. There are, there are Wi-Fi when they're at a station. There are all kinds of different, they have like four different communication networks for a locomotive as it's driving around. And then of course it drives on other people's tracks, right? So they have to do B2B and get real-time telemetry when one, you know, a train from one uh, company is riding on somebody else's tracks through their network. So there needs to be interoperability of all this in real time. They're dealing on the order of about 200,000 kind of endpoints that they're tracking at any time. 
And unfortunately, the, the radio network that they use for this communication is a time division multiplex network. So what that means is they only have a fraction of the second to transmit their information because the other fractions of the second are used for some other customer. So it guarantees that they get these huge spikes because they have to send all their data in, their, in that little small millisecond of, uh, of information. And in spite of all that, the government mandated that they be able to have something called positive train control, which means if a train is, is detected to be out of control or for whatever reason, you need to remotely be able to shut it down and stop it. Okay? So they need to be able to calculate its speed, how long it takes its braking distance, and be able to stop it in time that it doesn't you know, run into something. Um, and all of that with a big, huge bunker, you know, their operational data center is this, it looks like, it's like mission control at NASA, but it's literally underground in a, in a, in a tornado-proof bunker. Uh, because they need to be able to run, it, run uh, on this network all the time. They want to do real-time optimization because they have service level agreements it's for their customers, like the major um, courier companies, like a UPS or FedEx, says I have to get my stuff there by a certain time or they get fined, they get uh, chargebacks and clawbacks. And you, know, you can't move, trains have to go only on certain tracks. So you have to worry about choke points and things like that. So as they go over a bridge, if you have a double high train, you have to worry about what's the wind speed and how fast can you go across that track and is there you know, a, a weather system moving in. So slightly speeding up and slowing down a train just a little bit saves so much fuel that it's millions of dollars to their bottom line if they can run it a tiny bit slower. But if they need to speed it up in order to you know, not you know, miss that choke point or be able to get around that weather event, it's the difference of being on time. It might be millions of dollars or not, you know, in terms of their, their SLAs. So it's a really, really interesting, real-time, big data kind of environment, distributed environment that I think fits in well with this. I mean, they built their own algos, their own CEP engines to optimize this and to do it for humans as well. So they're prompting humans who for a long time have been the experts that knew how to do this in their head. Now they're augmenting that with more and more algorithmic stuff. So it's a lot like an analogy to the uh, algo trading world where you used to just give the trader all the information they made their decisions, but you know, more and more of that was, uh, was, was done for them by the computer. So that was a very interesting one. We did another one also for the Department of Homeland Security, which was, uh, they call it IC Bernie, which is Integrated Chemical Biological radiological, nuclear, and explosive. <laughs> so that's, yeah, it sounds a lot more scary when you say it all out, but what it basically is is a multi-sensor fusion network, right? What that means is there's completely different sensors that detect explosions or audio sensors that can pinpoint when a shot goes off to know where that shot happened rapidly, um, or different types of chemical sensors for different types of uh, uh, of uh, uh, things that it can uh, detect. Um, and they need to take all of this in real time, bring it back, have, again, like an operational control center, situational awareness. So, uh, you know, if one of those trains were to derail and there was a chemical spill and it was chlorine, they need to know sort of which way is the wind blowing, which way is the plume going to go, how do I deal with this kind of a situation, right? Or if there's a bomb and I know the size of the package is this big, they can quickly calculate what the blast radius is based on certain you know, known types of, of explosives and, and the sensors to detect which kind it is. And a really interesting thing I found out from this was the radiation sensors. So you know, they have radi radiation sensors around, can't, you know, I'm, I don't even know exactly where they are, but um, you know, they can detect and infer whether something is moving down a highway, for example, or across a bridge, what direction it is by, by the sequence that it lights things up. And I found out that the, the big problem in radiation detection is that it's such a, such a, a small amount that you're detecting. The things like kitty litter, the clay in kitty litter has enough radioactivity that it'll set off one of these sensors, right? Or if you've had a cancer treatment where, you know, your, own, your body might actually set off one of these uh, sensors. So um, there's sort of the initial screen of taking a reading and getting a positive, and then there's the much larger amount of data, which is the full spectrum that they have to give to a scientist to determine whether or not it's plutonium or whether it's kitty litter 
or, or what kind of you know, thing it is that set the thing off, right? Um, so, you know, it's a combination of very small events, very small yes-no kind of readings, and these very large, uh, um, you know, big blobs of data that need to be communicated around. Uh, so that, that was another very interesting um, uh, project that we worked on. Um, you mentioned uh, financial services. Financial services is amazing. There's new bubbles in this chart all the time. This was a build slide. Uh, uh, a, a when we were in New York, we did this one, and, and, and a colleague of mine walked through each bubble and explained what each bubble did. I'm not going to do that because it's not my forte. I've been out of finance for a while. But it, you know, a lot of things that you think are very human-oriented, even like when a trader just makes a trade for you, uh, and it's not an automated trade at all. There's an amazing amount of automation in that, right? Like if you sell a sizable position in a co equity, the smart order routing systems look at all these different liquidity pools now uh, and have to decide, you know, what, how to chunk up that order into the smaller pieces and get the best uh, price for it across the multiple different pools of liquidity, which are all dynamically changing as you're filling that order. So it's not like you just fire and forget. You actually dynamically pull stuff back and, and f uh, fill it the second half of your order in into another one of the, uh, the pools. So um, I think, you know, I think if I've learned anything from working in finance is a lot of this technology makes its way out into other use cases. So it's always good to, take, uh, to keep an eye on what they're doing in, in those kind of mar markets. Um, I mentioned a mobile uh, phone carrier. This is, this, is, this is really all about the sort of 360 degree view of a customer. So the idea, I mean, it used to be you just tried to get customer record master in a database somewhere, right? Um, but having it in a spinning disk just isn't good enough anymore, right? It has to be in an in-memory data grid so it can be queried rapidly. And, it ha and then that's distributed across you know, multiple data centers and multiple markets and multiple subcarriers and all that kind of stuff, right? So it becomes this problem of, of dealing with all the legacy of you know, call detail records coming off of the switch, ETL batch jobs, uh, uh, bringing in new uh, billing plans and all kinds of information like that, real-time data flowing in in, uh, in, in uh, proprietary and open standards, so AMQP, JMS, now MQTT is, is pretty interesting, uh, open standard for that. Um, and then taking that and distributing it out to all these distributed data grids so that as the users now come in from their mobile devices or in through the web center, and, and you look at your, your home portal and you want to see, you know, what, how many minutes have I used? Well, how many, how many minutes have I used on my plan right now, as of now, not like 15 minutes ago or as of yesterday, but in real time. So all of that information is now flowing in, distributed through a distributed uh, messaging, multi-data, uh, multi-master, all active-active across seven um, data centers into um, Oracle Coherence and Cassandra and, and a lot of these sort of in-memory uh, um, data grids so that it can be queried rapidly right out uh, from all the web services and the OSOA gateways, right? So that's, uh, that's what I had. Um, I just open it up for questions or comments or... Um. Yep. For real-time event processing, it really depends on how you want to process events. I mean, uh, I, there's things that are a simple, there's like what I would call simple event processing, which means an event comes in and you, you want to do something, you want to do some comparison, maybe you just want to see whether a value is over a threshold or not and set off an alert. You can do a lot of that kind of work in hardware now. You can do that in a, in a FPGA and crank, you know, wire speed, 10 gigabit, you know, events through that kind of thing. If the more complex event processing has like uh, a, a, a time aspect to it. So you might want to keep like an average or something like that to say like over the last minute has more than X percent of things happened or is my average more than a certain amount. Uh, or, or you might have multiple inputs where you say if this event happens and this event happens and within a certain amount of time this other event happens, that's the trigger that sends the, the, the alert out the far side. 
And for the more complex and the more temporal kind of events, then that's where you get into a, a, a complex event processing engine. You know, so you get like a ready engine or something like that, and there's multiple different vendors that make those kind of products. Um, the, the, the key is to not overflow those engines with lots of uh, useless data, that there are a lot of events that they don't care about, that aren't going to trigger anything. So if you can dynamically filter the incoming data and only send events that are going to be pertinent to each one of those CEP engines, then you'll get a lot more scalability and not have to have you know, a lot of wasted uh, uh, processing power just throwing, throwing things away that are unnecessary. Did that answer your question? Yeah? Um, regarding the slow consumer problem, yeah. um, are, you know, just thinking of the ways to deal with it, mm -hmm. is, is the solution typically bound to just rejecting income, new, newer data or re reducing the frequency of incoming data? Or it depends on how critical the data is, right? If you absolutely can never, ever lose a message, then you do have to back pressure your input to the same rate as your outputs, right? At least until you get more capacity online some way to increase the output, right? Um, but not everything is an absolutely once and only once guaranteed kind of problem, right? So that's when you get into these things where you're, you're lighting the messages, you're throwing them away. Um, and that, that works actually quite well. Um, and most messaging today is one where, you know, each record is a full, complete record now, right? Especially with the data grids, because everything is put and get of the whole record. You're not, you're not typically up, updating individual pieces. So, yeah, you can throw something away if you know that there's at least one more uh, message that came after it. It, it, it is a big problem. I mean, it's fundamentally the biggest problem that there is. If you buffer it in the middle, you have to think about what are you buffering it in, right? If you're buffering it in memory, at some point you run out of memory. If you're buffering it on disk, you run out of disk. It's all a matter of setting the right alerts that say, I don't expect this to get bigger than 60% full. So when it hits 60% full, you start, the alarm bells have to go off. These are operational you know, events now, right? It's the same sort of architecture, but you're looking at how full is my queue? You know, how full is my, my message pool? Or how much memory do I have left on my system? And alerting people to take action uh, uh, before, before you get a critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned polling and how we cycles by you know, checking all the time. When yeah. It changed. Yeah. Um, is it possible? I want to see what you think. Is it possible to have async communication or async channel between the client and the server? Yeah. So they exchange. Messages in Absolutely, yeah, and WebSockets already gives us that. So HTML5 WebSockets will give you in a single TCP session asynchronous bi-directional uh, communication, right? So what about, I mean, what about using one of the AMTP or JMS? Yeah, e any of those will work as well. I mean, JMS not so much because JMS really is an API. It's not a wire protocol. So. Um, I mean, JMS will let you write portable code, and it will give you what, what you're saying, provided you have the same vendor on both ends, right? The beauty of MQTT and AMQP and WebSockets is it's a wire protocol, so now it doesn't matter what's on either end. It, first of all, it doesn't have to be the same programming language, so it doesn't have to be Java. Uh, you can just be sending XML or JSON or whatever you want, and you can have Ruby on one end, and you can have your Node.js on the other end from two different vendors. So that's a big, big step forward. Um, Based on your experience, do you get a good performance by using that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've done personal testing, so I can tell you on both extremes. Uh, we've got up to 17 million messages per second, so about uh, 40 gigabits of throughput with a, with a, like a WebSocket connection, uh, not a single connection, right? <laughs> But a single node, like in terms of that horizontal scalability versus vertical, a single node could get up to that. Um, so more than one 10 gig Ethernet. You'd have to have multiple Ethernets and like, link aggregate them. Uh, so it's definitely possible to get very, very high speed connections. Um, and, and part of that is you're not wasting a lot of overhead on HTTP. The problem with HTTP polling, I mean, it's great that it works everywhere and it works through every proxy and all that kind of stuff, but every time you're doing another poll, 
you have that huge overhead of another HTTP header going and coming back, right? Where with a consistent socket, with web sockets, it's just mostly the data. There's very little overhead on the actual transport. Um, so I think that's the way to go for the massive scalability. Yeah. And now with web sockets, I mean, it starts with an HTTP connection. So it'll work through your firewall. If it can't make the connection, then what you do is you start backing off, right? You, you, you try WebSockets. If WebSockets doesn't work, well, then you try HTTP binary long polling. If that doesn't work and your browser doesn't support binary, then you do base64 encoding of your data and you start polling with that. You kind of just back off so you get the best, you know, you start and then you get to the best you can do for that one particular client. Uh, and now, in terms of number of connections, that's the other extreme, right? So if you're, if you're just running standard Linux and you run out of file descriptors, you know, you can have as many sockets open as you have file descriptors. So it's a matter, that's really what you're probably gonna run out with unless you're doing high volume. You know, you, if you have, you could have a million users sitting there doing one thing every minute. It's not a lot of volume, but it's eating up your, it's eating up your file descriptors. So that's where you have to either tune the kernel or you have to look at dedicated sort of hardware, but basically the equivalent of like an F5 load balancer, but for, for socket connections now instead of HTTP, where the actual TCP stack is in a network processor and it can handle many, many, many more connections than a standard Linux kernel could be tuned to do. Yeah. Okay, question? Have you done Yes, yeah, so things like open onload, the kernel bypass, um, there's let's say NIC cards, TCP offload engines, what they're called, or kernel bypass. So there's kind of two flavors of those. One is where the TCP stack is in hardware in the NIC, um, so it's, it's not in the kernel. Uh, and then the other is where it's still in software, but it's in user space rather than in the kernel. So then it has its own buffer and you can have multiple of those. And uh, yeah, so they, they both work well and they both will chop down. Like if you're in a highly latency sensitive environment, like in, 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 in algo trading and that kind of stuff, if you do have to make a network hop, they're almost always using some kind of kernel bypass technology, yeah. Yep. I was curious when you were talking about those um, eliding and completion yep. use cases. Yep. Um, those are obviously very powerful techniques, but you yeah. may have cases where the application needs to be aware that it's happening. Yeah. Especially if you have kind of a system integration use case yeah. where different vendors may be providing applications on each side. They need to have that right. contract kind of settled ahead of time. Yeah. And is that something that you can handle at, at runtime or yeah. to advertise contracts to each other and yeah. check whether it's valid? Yeah, you can. You can you can add signaling that basically says I'm is am I an eliding eligible client, right, or not, right? Because you want to mix and match these things too. Uh, some clients might say, "Sorry, I, I I can't do that. I'd rather wait but you for the data." Set up manually separate data streams for doing that signaling that your application would negotiate. Or well, does I've done it dynamically. I've done I've I've, I've seen systems essentially where uh, the server it will dynamically figure out whether it needs to do eliding for a particular client or not and at what rate each client can go. And then those clients are going to be dynamically changing. So if you're on a mobile phone and you're moving around, you might have a high speed connection in one place, but you move and then you have a slower speed connection. So you have to like be dynamically changing it as you go. Um, and you know, some of it does involve putting timers and heartbeats and things like that so that you can tell that the client, you always have to have those to know your client is still there. You can't count on just having an open TCP connection. But um, yeah, it, it's very possible to do it all dynamically. Yeah. We're out of time? We're out of time, okay. Thank you very much. Uh...